Oh, Lord, Father, we thank you for bringing us here this morning. And Lord, Father, we continue to pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will go forth before us to prepare the way that, Lord, Father, you also prepare the hearts as those that's here and those that are coming in. And Lord, Father, you continue to soften our hearts that we may hear your voice, that we may see your ways, and that we may taste and know that you are good, O oh Lord. And Lord, Father, we pray that you let your uh, graciousness continue to fall upon us. And Lord, Father, cause us to receive it well, only, Lord, for it is a work that only you and only you can do. So, Lord, we pray that you begin to change our hearts from the inside out and cause your word to be effectual in our life, O oh Lord. And we pray all this in your name. We say, Amen. 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 So today uh, we're going to have a short little message. I'm going to talk a little bit about repentance and restoration in context with uh, Psalms 51. And I think it's a psalm that a lot of people know very well. It's a pretty popular one. So let me turn my Bible there. So today I want to talk a little bit about um, Psalm 51 in the introduction. And I think it's interesting because the, when I was reading my Bible in my hater, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, to the choir master, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. I think most of us, we kind of know this well enough. We know kind of what's happening and what's the context to this psalm. And I think it's interesting. Like here we are talking about David, like the the almighty David here. And like it's one of those kind of time person where we thought that, oh, this person is like a, he's a holy man of God. Like he don't sin. <laughs> but of course, it's not the case. We know that in this, like a, David has sinned greatly. And so I thought it was interesting because like a, still God called David a man after his own heart. So I thought it was kind of interesting because a lot of times, your calling and your sanctification are kind of a separate issue. You don't have to be perfect when you come before the Lord. In fact, I think God is a lot, a lot of times God is very forgiving and He's very merciful. And he don't expect us to be fully perfect as we come to Him. And we still can do His calling without being perfect, although we should strive towards that goal. Uh, let's see, can we have the first slide? Yeah, there you go. And so, like here, we see David, the man after God's heart. Let's turn, actually, to Acts 13, verse 22. Well, if you want, you can put a bookmark in Psalms 51. I'll use some mask. And Acts 13, verse 22, it says here, let me see. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. So here again, we see God calling David a man after his own heart, even though he has sinned, even though he was not perfect. But still, God say He is a man after my own heart. And now, so we're going to go into this and look a little bit why God would say so. And so, uh, let's have the next slide. So let's take a look again back to Psalms 51 in the first few verses. So let's take a look at the first two verses here. In Psalms 51, in verse 1, it says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Well, maybe let's go on a few more verses to verse 6. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me, and against you, you only have I sinned and have done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth, in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. So again, what we see here, it's all men are fallible. If any, anybody here, it's perfect. 
Of course, I raise my hand just as an example. I'm not perfect. <laughs> Everybody knows it. Well, nobody's perfect except God Himself. And, but I think what, what is interesting here is like a, to understand the heart of God and to know what He can do for you. And sometimes we call that having faith in God. And this is what like, I exactly I would say that David has. So when we kind of take a look at the first two verses and take a look at how, how he's, after his sin, he's uh, talking to God, he's praying to God. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So how often times like, you hear people when they're praying, they'll be like, Oh God, forgive me. But you see here, I think something that's different with David, he says, Oh God, forgive me because of, with your abundant mercy. Like you truly understand who God is. And you understand the nature and attribute of God. You know that God will forgive him. But he's still repentant. So I think that's the nice part about what he was doing here. And that's the next, like, uh, actually, let's take a look at uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 9 through 10. I have a lot of Bible flipping today. First Peter 2, verse 9 through 10. And he says in verse 9, he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for its own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So what we see here is uh, when we commit any kind of sin, uh, Oh, I think I'm missing a point. <laughs> Let me backtrack a little bit. So what we see here, it's the abundance of God's love and His creation. And we see that like God is so loving that His love overflows out of Him into the world. So sometimes you might think of, like, oh, why does God have to love people like us? Like if God's love within the Trinity, is it enough? But here the answer is God's love within the Trinity, it's enough, but it's abundant it's overflowing that he created us so that he can continue to love us even though we are sinful and i think that's uh something amazing that's something different from i would say other religions because in this god becomes almost like a father to us it's not a way but he's in fact he's like a, always by our side and like uh from the last few sermons like uh which i talk about god's love you see, God's love is very abundant. They even pour out His Holy Spirit, a part of Himself, as a down payment for us. And I got almost as you can think of what a privilege this is that God Himself, a being that's transcendent, that's above us, is willing to put Himself and give Himself to us. And that is down payment for us. And that's like something I thought was pretty huge. <laughs> And that is down payment for saying that like Christ will someday come back and redeem us. And now the down payment so that you'll be assured, it's I'll give you the Holy Spirit so that you know you are written in the Lamb's book of life. And that's pretty amazing. And so we continue to see God's love throughout the whole Bible all the time. And that's like a very integral part of uh, the whole Christian walk, I would say. It's understanding how God loves us. And then we we pre we pre creating this love. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Forgive my pronunciation. I got jumbled up in my mind. We creating reciprocating something like that. <laughs> well, the English apart, let's continue to move on. <laughs> you were doing amazing. 
<laughs> well, let's uh, take a look at the next few verses in Psalms 51. Of course, I have not forgotten my bookmark here. And in verse 3 to 5, it says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. And against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So here, it's like, uh, we have to think a little bit. Like uh, David was saying, Oh God, it's only against you, and you only have I sinned. But we might come up with this question, like, uh, did he sin against Uriah too, by stealing his wife? But if we think deeper about it, like we see that all sins are committed against God. Because like there's only sin when there's a moral code, and God is the moral code himself. He is the law himself. And without the law, there's like a no basis for saying, oh, I'm sinning or I'm not sinning. So therefore, like uh, all sin comes against God and only God himself, foremostly. But of course, like, uh, we have to talk about uh, restoration. We have to talk about a lot more. We cannot just stop there because we are all humans. We don't really understand. We cannot fully comprehend God as He is. We cannot easily forgive as He is. But we'll talk about that a little bit more. But what we see here is David's confession towards God. And he knows truly that the sin that is committed is first and foremost against God and only God. And it's the same way for us, like how many times when we come before God, uh, we recognize our own sin and we recognize that it's only against Him and Him alone that we are sinning. And I think here it's like, a, it's really the heart of David that uh, I would say God cherishes, that God really appreciates, that He's quick to confess, He's quick to know His sin. But then I think the other part that was interesting here is when it talks about uh, before, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me in verse 5. Because here we're talking about original sin. Because what we see here is the work of God. He's able to forgive the sin that you have on yourself and also the original sin. And this is a little bit of a foreshadowing forward. And we'll come and go into this a little bit more because what we know is Christ, when he died on the cross, he forgives our sins from the very start to the very end. And that's something amazing. And that includes our original sin too. And sometimes you might hear people sin like, say like, oh, I'm, I didn't sin today. <laughs> I'm a good person. I did well today, God. But like, uh, if you, you have to consider that if you are not in Christ, like you, you still have the original sin. Once you are born, you are sinful already. So it's almost there's no escaping sin. There's nobody that can be perfect. And of course, with our Lord Christ Jesus, you know, he was born partly by part of the Holy Spirit and he's God himself. And that allowed him to be sinless. And that's why he has to be born of the virgin birth. And that's the significance there. And let's take a look at uh, Psalms 51, verse 6. It says, Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. And here, what we see here is David, he has the fear of God, and he understands the fear of God. And what allows him to really understand this and say all this, it's really the work of the Holy Spirit that's working in him. And as we talk about the Holy Spirit, remember, he, he is the promise of the Father. So let's turn to Proverbs 9 and verse 10. And let's see what it says here. Let me put my bookmark. Proverbs 9 and verse 10. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So I remember uh, a couple of years ago, uh, when I was talking to this uh, other friend of mine, I was saying, like, uh, like, we need to have the fear of God. 
and he, he's just kind of like a macho guy, and he says, oh, I, like, what do you mean by fear? I don't fear anybody. <laughs> like, why do I have to fear other person? Like, when you talk about fear, then he was saying, are you talking about I should be scared of God? And I think it's like a, there's a small little nuance here. There's a lot of times when you talk about fear of God, it's a fear out of love. And it's a little bit different than the fear of God that it's out of a true fear of God. In some way it is because we always fear that what God can do if we are not Christian. And that sometimes propel us to move forward. But I think this fear of God, it goes a little bit deeper into understanding who God is and you are fearing Him because of His attributes. But this fear is not the kind of where, what we think usually. Like, oh, like I'm scared. Like a, it's the fear so much that it cripples me. But I would say like this fear, it should propel us to love God even more. It's a little bit different kind of fear. For example, uh, uh, say in your house, you have a big spider that's crawling on your wall. <laughs> and it's like, oh, it cripples you. You cannot move in there because there's this, you cannot go into this room because there's this big spider running around. It's a little bit different when we talk about the fear, this kind of fear compared to fearing God where it's more of like a, a reverence for God himself as if he was your father. Like you have respect for God because you know that he's above you, he's transcendent. And this, this fear is it's backed by reverence, it's backed by a respect for God. So let's also turn to Philippians 1 verse 6. Let's take a look and see what it says there. And in Philippians 1 verse 6, it says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And we see this is what the Holy Spirit is really seeking to do. He will continue to work within us. He will continue to bring us to the greatest sanctification because the Bible do say, be perfect as our Lord Father is perfect. And as we proceed in this journey, uh, there, will, there will be a lot of times where we will fall. There will be a lot of times that we will come before God and we will confess our sin. But I think that's not it. Because what God sees is this is a journey for you. And it's, it's kind of like a, like a child, isn't it, when you have a kid? Like sometimes you do like crazy stuff. It's like, <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> and like, uh, after, even sometimes after you tell the, the kid, oh, don't do this, then after one week later, it, it happens again. <laughs> so I remember that with my niece. It's, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> like uh, she had this like a small little fish tank, and she has this couple of guppies in it. Uh, so for some reason, it's kind of strange. Like uh, she decided that she wanted to feed it with lots of food. <laughs> so she poured lots of food. And the whole tank, like, uh, it was like cloudy. It was full of food. And she oh, I need to stir it. And she stirs it. And the fish is like, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> so, so my sister was like really mad. She said, don't do it. The fish will die. And so, uh, she got like a scolding out of it. And she cried and stuff. But then I thought that would be the end. Then a couple of days later, she went and stood by the fish bowl again, and she stared for like a minute, and she stirred it again. I was like, oh, what is she thinking? What, what was she thinking in that one minute of period that she was standing before the fish bowl, then stirring? And I think that's something interesting because, um, isn't it like us sometimes, like uh, when it comes to our sins too? Like a lot of times, like uh, we sin and we tell God, oh God, like uh, I'm really repentant of this. Like God, forgive me. Then, what well, you know, it's the next day or sometimes a couple of hours later, you commit the same sin again. And I think it's kind of interesting. Maybe, maybe if you think in the the mindset of God, God must say, oh, what is he thinking? <laughs> but of course, God is probably not that way. 
But it's a, I would say it's so much often with us uh, through our lifespan of, what, 80, 90 years. Like we will continually sin against God. But I think the, the nice thing about Christianity, it's, it's a journey. Like the magnitude of sin becomes smaller and smaller. And the sin that you commit first, it affects you great. But the smaller sins that you commit later on in your Christian walk, you, you feel it even more because now you begin to love God even more. So the weight of even the smallest sin brings you down sometimes. And this is also something that's for us to look forward to when one day we'll go into heaven because heaven is a place that finally will be without sin. And can you imagine a place that's without sin? That means there's no bad thing at all. Like when you go into heaven... I heard this sermon, you were, uh, this preacher, he was saying, what you'll find in heaven is that when you enter there, like you'll be filled with joy. It's, uh, it's like you, you go to a theme park. It's like, oh, the first time you go to a theme park, oh, it's so fun. This place is great. But the better thing is the next day, you'll find even more. And the next, next day, you'll find even more. And the next, the next day, it's more and more. It accumulates over time. So it's sometimes it's kind of mind-blowing because there's nothing that's like this on earth. Mm-hmm. We might experience something like really exciting, really fun for one day, but most of the things in earth, almost everything, eventually it wears out. But while well, you see, heaven's not like this. Heaven's like a, the day you go in, it gets better and better and better every single day. Amen. And sometimes that's it's a comfort to our souls because when we think of this, we remember, oh, God, finally, this is like a place where you have freedom. And on earth, sometimes it prompts you even more to do the work of God because you know your price is a hit. And um, I remember in military, uh, when we're talking about like having a goal in front of you, it's important. I remember that there's a time in military like uh, where uh, those uh, military sergeants, they like to do this, like a, where they say, okay, run to the tree, that's your punishment. And they run to the tree. Then they run back, and the sergeant will say, no, you are going to the wrong tree, it's the tree behind. Then they run there and come back, they say, it's not that one, it's that one behind. <laughs> and it's challenging when you have like a goal that's such as this, because it keeps on going, going, on. like eventually you'll get tired. It's like, oh, where is the end? Like, you'll be like, after the third time you come back, it's like, okay, tell me what tree, <laughs> what tree exactly. And I would say in Christian life, like, uh, God has provided this goal, this tree for us that we can see and we can already know what it is. And so he prompts us as we are getting closer and closer. We go, oh, we are in this journey, we are saying, oh, God, we are getting closer and closer to the end. And there's something comforting sometimes. So let us continue to the next slide. And this part is about repentance. It's verse 7 through 14. So we'll look at verse 7 through 10 here first. Let me go back to Psalms 51. And let's take a look at verse 7. It says, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. O oh, create in me a new clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. So here we see like David goes straight into repentance. So I think that's another thing like in Christian life. Like oftentimes what we see, sometimes people confess, but they don't repent. And what's the use of confession without repentance? Isn't it? So, but I think like, oh, something interesting here is that when we take a look at what hyssop is in the Bible, probably one of the first few things that come to our mind, it's hyssop, it's the, one, the thing, it's like this, a plant that usually is dipped in lamb's blood for purification during the Passover. It's the one that they put on the doorpost too. So what you can see here, his salt is almost like a transfer agent. It's like something that can transfer things from one to the other. And of course, what we see here is uh, 
when we talk about he stopped dipping lamb's blood for purification, and it foreshadows Christ's work. And the lamb's blood is Christ's blood, and the he stopped transfers this uh, sin onto us. Well, not onto us, but onto God. <laughs> But transfer, rather, I'd say, the blood of Christ unto us so that we may be made righteous. And so uh, let us take a look here at Exodus 12, verse 21. Exodus 12, verse 21. It says, Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourself according to your clans and kill, kill the pest over lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood of, that's in the basin and touch the lint, lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that's in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. And so we see here, it transferred the blood of Christ onto us eventually. That's, it's foreshadowing this because later in this verse, it's talk about uh, the Spirit of God going through its house and where, whichever house that doesn't have this blood covered, like you'll, you'll go in and strike. You'll bring death into that household. And I think it's interesting because we can think of the house here as us. We had a house. When we say, we, when we take the hyssop, we put it on us. That's what Christ has done, put it on both, on both our sight so that we have a white linen, so that we may be made righteous before God. And so that eventually when God passed by, we will not suffer death. And that's the final hope, that's the defeat of death and no more death. And so the other thing that uh, we see here in Psalms 51 Well, I guess like a, a small little point here with his up too is uh, remembering Christ's death on the cross. Like the person had a his up and he dipped it in vinegar and gave it to Christ and he says, oh, it is done. So I think that's something interesting to think about what it means of sour wine with vinegar in the Bible. Anyway, let's move on and let's take a look at uh, Broken Bones. So, it is in verse 8. It says, Let me hear joy and gladness, and let the bones that you have broken rejoice. So, what we see here is also, when we talk about broken bones, there's another verse that also highlights it that's in the Bible. And it's in Lamentations 3, verse 1 through 4. So, let's turn there and take a look. Lamentations. All right, fine, found it. In 3, verse 1 through 4, it says, I am the man who has seen afflictions under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turned his hands again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. So what we see here when we talk about broken bones, it is to render something ineffective. And the other reference we see in the Bible a lot is when the Bible says the Lord will break his arm. Isn't it? You hear that a lot of times. And the arm is important because the arm, it's a lot of times it's used to direct your armies, to direct the things. And when you have a broken arm, you cannot point straight anymore. You'll be like, eh. It's like a, you have an arrow, but it's like, uh, 
You know, sometimes you have those arrow signs and uh, the wind hits it and it like, turns to like point downwards. <laughs> it's like, what? Where, where does that go? Is it left? It's not left or not right. It's like, is it going down? <laughs> going to hell? <laughs> hmm. But, and in this way, like a broken bones, it's kind of similar sometimes. Like uh, in the Bible, when you have broken bones, it says to render something ineffective. And a lot of times it's through sin. And it's because of sin that sometimes you feel the weight of these sins as you come before a holy and righteous God. And sometimes the weight of your sin crushes you so much that it renders you ineffective. And I'll say, like, a, if you are not a Christian and there's something you will suffer, but I would say, even so, when you are Christian, sometimes you suffer a similar effect because when you sin, when the work of God is within you, you feel the weight of your sin. And I think that's something amazing because a lot of times, uh, think about when somebody's not a Christian, like they don't even think they are sinning at all. Like it's like it's like oblivious to them. They are blind to what is sin. And sometimes if you are, even sometimes some people who proclaim that they are, they are a Christian themselves, they are blind to their own sin. I would say sometimes if you do feel uh, being weighed out by your sin, it's not a bad thing sometimes because I would say it's the work of the Holy Spirit within you, prompting you to come towards God. And that's the only solution here because who can forgive sins? It's only God alone, only Christ alone. And uh, also a lot of times I, I would say sometimes people find other ways to cover up this uh, weight, this uh, transgression that they might have felt. And that's, that's, as humans, that's sometimes what we do a lot of times too. Like we try to, there, there's a lot of times there's only God's way. If you want to be relieved of this weight of sin, you have to come before God and ask for His forgiveness. But so oftentimes we find our own ways Maybe sometimes some people might go to counselors, they might talk to other people, they might do works. They might say, oh, maybe, maybe today I'll read more of my Bible. That'll help me relieve this weight of this sin here. And I think what's interesting, it's, uh, this is exactly what I think Martin Luther would have felt during those times before the Reformation. As you're going through all these works, it's interesting because I remember uh, he was saying, like, he, if there's any monks, he's probably the best of them all. That's what he said. So that's some big words. But that, doesn't that remind you of somebody in the Bible, too? At Paul, it's, it's like, a, if you're a Pharisee, I'm the Pharisees of Pharisees. But what he says next is, I count all those as rubbish. And so I think it's interesting, like so often we find ways to get forgiveness of God, but not through coming to ask for forgiveness of God, but through the works, through things that are different. And sometimes it might have a small little effect but on our own emotion, but usually it doesn't cure it. And uh, I think uh, the other interesting thing here, it's uh, Christ, remember, he has no broken bones. Oh, there's something also to think about. Let's take a look at John 19, verse 33. In verse 33, it says... Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to... Oh, sorry, wrong verse. <laughs> to make sure you guys are paying attention. Verse 33. <laughs> All right, I'm here. 
So now you get the actual thing. It says in verse 33, But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not, they did not break his legs. Yeah, I think it's kind of in, interesting here because Jesus, he has to be whole. He has no broken bones. So that this signifies that he's not, his atonement was not rendered ineffective. But his atonement, it's a whole. It's able to go from the very least to the very greatest, from the very start to the very end. There's no bricks within any, in any part of him. And it's effective throughout the whole body of Christ. And I thought that was an interesting point here. Well, of course, let's continue on. Let's take a look at verse in Psalms 51. Verse 10. It's a very popular one, and the one I like a lot. It says, Create in me a new clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. <coughs> I'll tell you, a lot of times when we come before God, isn't that what we always pray for? Oh God, that you create a clean heart within me. Oh Lord God, that you give me a new spirit, one that was different from before. And a lot of times we expect that God kind of do it. In some ways, like a, that we don't... It's, it's, it's interesting because I think in the Christian life, uh, a lot of times when we feel this way of our own sin, we oftentimes we go before God and we kind of have this hope that He'll take it all away, that we won't have this sin anymore in our life. And sometimes He does that. But more often times, He guides us through this process because He's a good Father. And you, you probably have heard this before. Um, but sometimes when it comes to helping people, like sometimes you have to have them do they have to have them learn on their own. And that's kind of what God is after also. That's trying to help us to learn on our, our own. If you are just a child and your parents do everything for you, like what you probably end up with is like a child that don't know how to do anything when it's adult. And that's like a, what God wouldn't want for us. And I think it's, it's really cool because a lot of these parallels we see in our lives with God, it's also evident with, uh, between a father and a kid. And so I, th I think it's, uh, it's sometimes a challenging thing to know when to give help, how much help to give. But that's something to think about. <laughs> so let's continue on here. And we see that, uh, that God is able to forgive sins indefinitely through the work of Christ. But he's still fair because it's through Christ. When we talk about sin, when we're when taking the sin, uh, we're putting all the sin onto Christ, when he's washing us with uh, his righteousness, it's not without its cause. God is not like a, he does not play cheats. <laughs> It's not like you're playing a game and you're in a cheat code. It's, oh, you can suddenly go from this to there. Uh, God has the universe and the law still persists wherever you sow something that you're rid. So there is still a cost that's here. But what we see, it's, it's through Christ that God has bared the whole, all this cost onto himself. That we don't have to suffer through this weight, this cost that we can never, ever repay fully. And that is the love of God that's poured out onto us. So let's take a look at Ephesians 1 verse 7. In verse 7, it says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. And isn't that comforting to see and to know? Let's also take a look at uh, one pitch later in Ephesians 2, verse 5 through 10. It says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised up 
with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable reaches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And the key verse here is, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it's the gift of God and not a result of our works. And when we talk about a gift, it's given to you. Like a, you, Sometimes you, you don't do anything to deserve a gift, especially when it comes to this context. When God gives, we are not deserving of anything at all because we are sinners. We have no way of paying it, paying it fully, the price that we have incurred. And it's only through Christ that's able to redeem us. And that's his atonement and his redemption through Christ. And we see here that like, uh, to some extent in other Psalms, it's, like, uh, it's probably through the revelation of the Holy Spirit that David kind of sees some of this because in the Psalms, he often talk about one that is to come that will forgive the sins. I thought that was kind of interesting. So let's continue on. In uh, Psalms 51, verse 11. It says, Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. So here what we see also is David, he sees the importance of the work of the Holy Spirit. And for us, I think we all should be, realize this, we all should see this, and we all should know the, the work, the importance of the work of the Holy Spirit within us. Because if the Holy Spirit is not in us, then we are not a part of Christ. And the Holy Spirit is not in us, we are not in life, we are in death. And we also see that like, uh, David, his whole life is dependent on Holy, the Holy Spirit guiding him to do different things. And we see the same thing with Christ too. Christ is saying, like, uh, what I see the Father do, I do. And I think that is the mark that's, that Christ has set the model for us, that we should have seen what we should, have, we should see what the Father does and we do. And a lot of times that depends on the work of the Holy Spirit. That is the work of the Holy Spirit to illuminate within us like His will, to be able to cause us to do His will. <clears throat> and so what we see here, it's uh, David truly understands this and he knows without this, like a death will definitely ensue. So let's continue on to take a look at verse 12 through 15. It says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. So one want to highlight here is the joy of our salvation, or sometimes it's called the joy of the Lord. And this joy we see a lot of times in the Bible, it comes through communion with God. And it's only with God alone that He can feel us. I remember there was this, uh, there was this a verse that says, uh, He set eternity in our hearts. Mm-hmm. Then I, I feel, and I think uh, for me at least this is true. I feel like a lot of times God has set this kind of gap within us. Like this need within, within us that can only be filled by communing with Him. It's almost like a tank uh, when you start communing with God, it fills up. This, your love meter fills up. But when you stop communing with God, it, it falls down. And because we are humans, our faith leaks. <laughs> Unfortunately, like, uh, it's, of course, in the Christian walk, as we go, th- go through it, like, uh, uh, the holes get smaller and smaller. When you're a baby Christian, the hole is big. Whatever pours up, comes up. <laughs> then we, hopefully, it's, over time, it shrinks that we are able to keep the faith, we are able to have less and less doubts of who God is and what He can do for us. 
And so uh, let's turn to uh, Philippians 3, verse 8 through 10. In Philippians 3, verse 8, it says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, (laughs) that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. And so some, some things that I want to highlight here, it's the importance of faith in our life as we are pursuing Christ. And you might remember uh, the, the five solas. Anybody remember those? One of them is sola fide, with faith alone. Of course, the other one, really important one, it's so by grace alone and sola Christos in Christ alone. By Christ alone, and there's also the scriptura. yeah scriptura in the word of his, is his word alone. And lastly, the last one is Sola Gloria. for His glory alone. And so what we see here, like a, there's a reason why they always put this five solas because it is important, and that's like a, a almost you would say the a quick summary of the whole Reformation that's in that five souls that they were trying to change the whole thought. And here we see why it's important. It's faith does bring, sometimes you can even say faith is the currency of heaven. Sometimes people use that term. Maybe it might not be the best, but it's a good way to think about it. That's still faith that we are able to receive and to know who God is Without faith, like we won't be able to know who God is. Without faith, we won't be able to believe what He can do. And I think there's a difference between our belief and faith. Because I think belief is a bit more one-sided because you can believe in something, but you can choose not to do something. Or you might even believe something and you might do it, but not willingly. But I'd say faith is a little bit different. Faith comes, it's, I think it's more... Inner, it's more in the, on the core where, where you begin to, when you say you have faith, it's you truly understand that it will come about and you believe and you do it like it's going to be. And oh, like a faith, it's always a challenging thing. Uh, a lot of times I, I would say, sometimes even like when praying for people who are sick, oh, that, that's where your faith starts trembling. <laughs> I know God will heal you, but do you really know God will, yeah. that God can heal this person? So that's like, oh, that's a challenge there sometimes. And I think uh, in this journey, a lot of times uh, as we go towards pursuing Christ, we are building our faith in this way also. Like when, we are, when we do, when we pray something, we believe in God. And sometimes in the starting, we may kind of tremble. Oh, God, will it really come to pass? But I think that's sometimes that's the beauty of Christianity because God sometimes do make those ha- things happen. And over time, and it happens more and more, your faith begins to build also. And you begin to see that God is able and God is able to do all the things. And you begin to know that he will and he would also. And I would say that's something that David know in his heart. And he had, because he has experienced it many times, that God has redeemed him and that he knows that God will forgive him and he knows the nature of God. So I I, I would say uh, it's 1024. Unfortunately, I didn't time this well. (laughs) I'm only halfway through. But we will end this and continue on next time. A little surprising. I only have eight slides, but... It took a long time. So let us close in prayer. 
Oh, Lord, Father, we thank you for your grace. And Lord, Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, for working within us, for continuing giving us guidance, for illuminating within our hearts, O oh Lord. And Lord, Father, as we pursue this journey, as we continue on to grow in you, that Lord, Father, that you continually blot out our transgressions before you, O oh Lord. And Lord, remind us of the work of Christ that cleanses us from the inside out, that give us a cloak of righteousness, that we may come before you to have communion before you, O oh Lord. And Lord, Father, we pray for that restore to us the joy of your salvation. And Lord, Father, that you'll cause this to be effectual within us from the inside to the outside, O oh Lord. And Lord, Father, let our works be the evidence of this work that you are doing within us. And Lord, Father, that we may please you and we may bring glory to your name and that our inner attitude will be right before you. And that, Lord, Father, we will have the joy of following you, O Lord. And, Lord, Father, we pray all this and thank you. And we say, Amen.